All right, here we are. Welcome everyone and uh, happy Friday to you all. It's a pleasure to be here um, to uh, celebrate the launch of uh, In the Footsteps of the Snow Leopard um, by Tim Easton. Um, Tim is with us here tonight uh, with Angela, Angela Pelk. I'll be introducing them very shortly. Um, but first, I'm just going to go through a couple of housekeeping things. And um, of course, um, I'm... Bianca from uh, the Avid Reader Events team. I'll be also managing our, our tech behind the scenes this evening and taking your questions. So thank you so much, everyone. This is a great turnout. It's just wonderful, um, wonderful to see everyone here supporting Tim um, and his book. Now, um, before we get underway, just as I mentioned, a little bit of housekeeping. If you haven't attended a Avid Reader uh, event before, there's just mm -hmm. a couple of points um, that I'll go through. And uh, so you'll see if you're not familiar with Zoom, everyone's Zoom is a little bit different just depending on which device you're joining us on. Um, but there is a chat function that you can use to communicate with your host, myself. Uh, and when we call for audience questions, um, I will do that in the chat. And this is where you can just reply to me and you can type them in um, and then I will read them out aloud um, at the end when we get to Q&A. But please feel uh, free to send through your questions at any time. Uh, tonight's fairly informal and we're going to be getting um, quite a treat um, uh, that Tim's got prepared for us. So um, a very visual um, launch. I'm excited for that. Um, so uh, just reiterating that you'll all be um, placed on mute for the duration of the conversation just to minimise any disruptions. However, at the end, we'll all be able to unmute and we can join in our round of applause. Um, so before I go any further, um, each of you, wherever you are this evening, um, I'd like you to uh, join me in acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land. Um, from where I call home here in South Brisbane, um, we know as Mianjin, um, I pay respect to the Yuggera and Turrbal people and to all elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge this land has always been and will always be a place of creativity community and storytelling. Now, to introduce our special guests this evening. Tim Easton has been an adventurer most of his life. Uh, he says here, except for a 20 year period of raising his three children here in Brisbane, Australia. Now, Tim, I don't have kids myself, but I have to say that still sounds pretty adventurous to me. Um, from the age of 13, he's hiked to some of the remotest parts of Lemington National Park. At 19, he deferred his university studies to travel um, to Cape York Peninsula, where he spent four months in very remote places and three weeks of that time at Lockhart River Aboriginal Mission. He has since traveled to England, Europe, Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, India, China, United States, Canada, and Zimbabwe. Safe to say Tim is well-traveled. Uh, Brisbane has been his family base and where he has been an active member of the Brisbane Bushwalkers for the past five years. And Tim graduated with a communication degree from Griffith University in 2000. Now, in the footsteps of the snow leopard, Tim follows his adventure um, in, into the remote northwest Himalaya in Nepal, facing sub-zero temperatures and high altitude in the hope of spotting the elusive snow leopard and finally hearing for himself the silent heartbeat of the earth. In conversation uh, with Tim is Angela Pelk. Angela is the Grants and Communications Officer for the Pencil Tree um, and Angela's going to talk a little bit more about that very shortly. Um, now, um, the Pencil Tree is Stevie Bellamy, Bellamy's charity, and Stevie wrote the foreword for Tim's book, which we'll also be sharing with you. So a very warm, avid reader welcome, uh, Tim and Angela. And uh, Angela, I'll pass over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. This is my first one of these um, virtual all real in terms of a book launch. So be gentle with me, everybody. Um, I wish you a really good evening and like to acknowledge that I'm coming from beautiful Bundjalung land um, down in Ballina or up in Ballina, depending where you are, and um, pay respects to elders past, present and emerging here and um, would like to say how much um, I appreciate the 
creative um, exploits of people working on whatever country they're working on. So that's my um, acknowledgement too. Um, it's, I've been asked to represent Pencil Tree tonight um, as um, in place of Stevie and I'm no, um, I, I don't do him justice because as Tim will, can attest, um, he's a very charismatic um, character and his work with the Pencil Tree has been um, how we came to be friends and we met up maybe three years ago um, I wrote a grant, an unsuccessful one, but he held on to me anyway, and we've been friends since. And so I've come to take on additional roles with Pencil Tree. If you don't know much about Pencil Tree, um, in the foreword he, um, that I'm going to read, it tells a little bit. But basically, he, Stevie is all about um, representing and um, supporting underprivileged children through education. So that's that's the pencil tree gig. It's based in um, Cabarita Beach. So connecting this tiny little beachside village with schools and um, children's homes in India and Nepal. So that's, that's that. So if you're happy for me, Tim, I'll just go ahead and read the forward. Mm, yeah, go ahead. It's great, yeah. So this is um, direct forward by Steve Bellamy. It says... The sheer magnitude of the mountain vistas and the warmth of the local people of the Himalayas touch me in a way that is hard to describe. I've been traveling to the mountains of Nepal and India for over 20 years and I'm delighted that my good friend Tim has been similarly captivated. These days, my time is spent more in the foothills helping needy children with educational programs and basic supplies through the Australian charity, The Pencil Tree which was set up to assist the underprivileged children who live in this majestic part of the world. From providing pencils, exercise books and scholarships to private schools, to feeding whole communities and actually building an entire school in 2019, the pencil tree is determined to give these amazing children a chance of a better life that their illiterate parents could only dream of. Tim's book will transport you to a land of ancient culture and smiling, hospitable people. And maybe one day you too can visit and be touched by this special place. But for now, sit back and enjoy a good read and imagine yourself on this journey with Tim in a land that nourishes the soul and challenges you in every way. You're in safe hands. <laughs> Namaste, Steve Bellamy, founder of The Pencil Tree. Thank you, Angel. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I have got a, a lot of photos that I could have playing in the background, and we we um, the anchor was setting us up before, and we um, it, it takes over the whole screen. So unfortunately, I won't be able to see you guys. But I'll I thought I might try and mingle it because the photographs are really lovely, and uh, rather than just looking at um, a picture of me and and what's here, I think that might I'll, I'll try and intermingle it anyway. So. <laughs> Does that sound fair enough? And I've got um, I've got about five readings I'd like to do out here. They're short readings. It'll go for about 25 minutes. They're just um, parts that I found quite, um, uh, I suppose, important for me and why I did it and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. So, uh, so I'll just see if I can get this technology to work. Um, the images are on uh, Instagram, by the way, and and there is a, a website that's up as well. So, um, but anyway, I'll just see if I can get these photos up and hopefully oh, that's good and Tim you can send, send us through your Instagram so that way I can post it to everyone on the chat here and they know what it is oh okay sure it's under my name or now or at the end yeah. oh whenever you like okay. <laughs> you all right back. okay yeah um all right now I just got to remember how to do this can you guys see that all right not yet um so okay. just if you I got a screen the screen share the yeah. green button then uh, green just select the window up. you'll be uh, sharing from. Hang on, where's the, ah, here we are, screen share. Oh, yeah, I've got you, yes, that's right. Myself and technology, it's not my favourite thing. But <laughs> so there's that image, or I can actually go for the full, how's that? Yep, perfect. And I think that'll, yeah, that'll keep turning. So we're in the low low areas, uh, low lands, I should say, of um, near Benny. Some, some of you may well know 
uh, Pokhara, it's quite a famous tourist town. Well, Beni is about 80 kilometres further west, and that's where this journey began. And it's also where Peter Matheson started his journey uh, with George Shaler, and I think it was about 20, uh, um, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, porters and, and, and guides and what have you. So, so these are just play through the incredibly interesting uh, images of, of, of daily life. And as I said, we're fairly close to civilization at this point. But yeah, anyway, I won't get distracted by the photos. I'll just try and um, uh, go into some of the, I just wanted, first of all, acknowledgements, because many, many people have helped me to put this book together. Um, so I just wanted to, firstly, that the team in Kathmandu, I don't know if Geary um, Kiwal is with us, but uh, um, he's the business brains behind Nepal Mountain Adventure. And uh, without him, and there's a whole story attached to that, partly of which I do tell uh, in the book. Um, but it's also uh, Dilip, my guide, and, and uh, Puna, my porter, who, who were just wonderful men that, that helped me uh, get through this, um, you know, very desolate country, very, very desolate. It, it, I remember reading about it before I left and, and sort of not really taking it on board until I actually got there and it, extraordinary. And you'll see as we get further up into the valleys um, just how desolate. Um, this is really quite rich country here at the moment. Oh, there's the snow leopard. You can show it yourself. So. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, where are we? Then? I also want to thank the many readers who read the first draft for me. It was a pretty catty draft, and I look back on it all now, but there were about a dozen people that really helped me to um, uh, make changes and move the book forward. Their feedback was invaluable in shaping the book, and to them, my heartfelt thanks. So to Anne Kemp, Libby Anderson, Annette Miller, Sandra Windsor, Shannon Bratton, Vanessa Orr, Robert Ahoon, David King, Sam Corman, Mike Mee, Tony Groom, Michael Meadows, uh, Anthony Logan, uh, Brendan Easton, Georgia Easton, and Imogen Easton. I don't know if they actually read it, but anyway, <laughs> they're my children. Um, uh, Rita Tisdale, uh, who's, who's here from uh, Denmark tonight. Uh, Susan Bainbridge, Ian Stevenson, is Susan here? Susan's from the north of England. Uh, Ian Stevenson, uh, Steve Bellamy, and Lee Jediah. So yeah, their input into, I mean, it was a, the best draft I could produce. And then I made modifications from that to go to a professional editor, which is also an invaluable part of any um, process of writing. So I've got a note here too, Rob Holden. Uh, he did the bulk of the editing. I also had some help for, um, uh, from David from Jellyfish Creative. But uh, David did the bulk of it in terms of, um, I, and I say here, it's fair to say that my creativity of writing is more my thing than the actual details of correct spelling, punctuation, grammar. I don't always get that 100% by any means. So thank you, Rob, for your patience and perseverance and all about 80,000 words of this book. And also uh, to Jennifer Hall from Creative uh, Jellyfish Creative for the book cover design, uh, website design and alterations and final preparation of layout for printing. And it was her partner, David, who was also very helpful in terms of um, uh, the editing process. And also very grateful to Tim Fisk, George Gummo, Peter McGlocky, and Victor Odman for their financial support last year when I was wondering how on earth I was going to get this thing finished. And uh, once, and, and also to my parents, John and Diana Easton, that I owe this. And I'm hoping my mother is tuned into this tonight. She's 92 years of old in a nursing home in New Farm. But um, I'll just care the place she's at there. Uh, we're going to try and and get her zoomed in. So hopefully that is happening. Um, and I, uh, a very last thank you and my grateful appreciation for their love and support over a, a lifetime. So um, this is the first, first reading. Is anybody happy with the photos just playing and me being in the background? Bianca? Okay. Um, Sorry, I can't, uh, answer. I can't answer for everyone, but... Um, no, okay. Does it sound okay? Just me in the background? It looks fine to me. Good, like, good. Just I'm, go I'm, with it. Yeah, <laughs> sure. It's That's a great okay. medium. It's a great way to experience a reading, I think, to have yeah, visual elements. Sure. So, There's a lot yeah. of earthy photos of potatoes and potato pots and, and yeah. vegetables. I just love the vegetables. That they yeah, have. I love the colour and the landscape. <laughs> We've just had a um, one of our attendees um, through the chat just pop up and say, um, yep, it's working really well. Well, go good it. okay well let, yeah. let's get going with it okay <laughs> so when i refer to peter in this this, this is peter matheson from uh, 1973 when he did it so peter's journey was a, an, an opportunity for me to walk in his footsteps i became very excited about this whole 
uh, trip when I was there. It was actually on the first trip to, to Himalaya. And just uh, what he had done with um, or the book he had written, which many of you may have read, and it's really an extraordinary um, piece of piece of work. So the, it started in Beni and followed the ancient trails northwest that eventually lead to Tibet and Mongolia through many valleys and over seven passes, ranging in height from 3,000 to 5,000 metres. The terrain is desolate but wildly exciting due to its remoteness, where cannabis grows to four metres and in April and May, caterpillar fungus uh, flourishes for the Chinese market that will pay upward of 20,000 US dollars per kilogram. I have, I have hired a guide and porter for this 24-day trek. We become good friends, and without their professional help, I could not have done this trip. Philip is a man in his 40s and speaks very good English. He's the son of a British Army Gurkha, which in some ways connects us, as my own father was British Army and had enormous respect for the Gurkha regiments and have fought against and alongside the British since the early 1800s. Puna is our porter, and he's as strong as an ox. He never complains, and at times is carrying over 30 kilograms. Is similar in age to Dilla, but alas, my limited Nepalese and his limited English prevent much verbal communication. However, I have the I have the greatest respect for him. For him, he does the lion's share of the cooking and carries most of the food and equipment. And between them, they bring sweet, hot, milky coffee to my tent at dawn when temperatures are minus uh, ten to fifteen degrees Celsius. Our bond for this 24 days is important. We must understand each other. And I am pleased to say we pass with flying colours and our respect for each other is solid. So just moving up, um, through the story. So we're about page 138. And this is day, day seven of, of the journey. And we just had stayed the night, a little village, a hill, hill village about um, 2,500 metres. So we're starting to get up a little bit of an elevation. Um, but I was very taken by uh, the guest house there. And as we leave the guest house, owner's very organised life, I feel appreciative for her hospitality, being so warmly received and the way she manages her guest house, but also for the way she treats her three-year-old daughter with such loving attention. Some of their furniture has hand-carved Buddhist symbols that remind me of the Nazi swastika when tipped at 45 degrees. This ancient symbol was copied and modified by the Nazis for over what for for their own hellish purposes. It has nothing to do with the original and ancient symbol belonging to Eurasia, which encompasses 93 countries dating back to the 9th century AD. This tilted version can also be found on the Snoldalund <laughs> runestone in Denmark, dating back to the Viking era, the 4th century AD. It has connections in Japan's ancient Buddhist culture, where it symbolizes the interplay of of the opposites such as heaven and earth, day and night, water and fire. It was also found in the ancient city of Troy, the Iron Age culture of Koban, pre-Christian Europe, ancient Greece and Native American Indian uh, cultures. Jainism, Hinduism, Buddhism and Christianity all use this precious symbol for celebrations such as puja, marriage and Vastu Shanti, a ceremony to cleanse the home. It is a symbol brought out of the universe and is over a thousand years old, I find it fascinating that it has emerged in so many cultures over time, none of which were connected by the internet, just a universal knowledge. And I just asked the question, how then did this become a Nazi symbol? But there could be lots of reasons. In all cases throughout the generations of et mulias uh, sapientes, you'll have to read that in the book as to what that means. <laughs> it's a little piece of Latin that I've put together for it. Uh, this symbol, uh, it was for good. It was not until the Second World War and the rise of the Nazi party that this precious ancient symbol was changed to represent the very opposite in, in form of hatred and, and uh, racial vilification, unlike the world has ever seen. Unsurprisingly, Hitler and Hitler in formulating the Nazi party sought out people to promote his cause. A French woman at the time known as Savitri Divi um, proclaimed Hitler as the avatar of the Hindu god Vishnu, one of the most powerful Hindu gods, but in none of these ancient cultures were they given the right to kill. Over six million people built armaments that caused untold destruction and killed millions more across Europe, not forgetting the overall contribution of greenhouse gases, the effects of which we are feeling today over 60 years on. 
So it's going on a bit further. Oh, this is um, this is interesting. The front cover um, is a photo of Puna, the guide, and um, oh, that's the marijuana. Looks healthy, doesn't it? So, <laughs> um, so yeah, this is at the base, the big mountain on the in the background there. It's over six thousand meters. It's Norbun Kang and Vanagar. If you're looking at the photo of the um, on the book, it's it's a little settlement. Well, it was a settlement at the base of of this. Um, path and we camped the night it was probably one of our coldest nights it would have been you know minus 10 minus 15 and uh, there was certainly a settlement there at some stage i could see the footing from from stone so yeah so that's just what this and this is a little bit about climbing uh, anyone who's climbed um, so th this particular pass is 5000 almost 5200 meters and yeah it has its own set of challenges you know i, I, I can only imagine what something like everest would be like but while climbing to the summit, a slow and deliberate effort at this altitude, my lungs drawing heavily for oxygen, I asked Dillip if there will be a tea stall at the top. My little joke runs rather flat as pancake as he too is struggling with the ascent. It's 700 metres of elevation from our camp, but it takes over three hours as it's straight up to the pass of 5,200 metres. There are many Tibetan flags strewn across the rock cairns and flagpoles, and Puna, of course, takes it all in his confident stride, his 30 kilogram basket on his, uh, on his back. The landscape is rugged and barren, sculptured by millions of years of weathering. A, a, a stubble brown grass grows in places, but closer to the pass, there is only rock. My breathing felt suffocating at times and I would stop every so often and lean on my walking poles and take several short breaths, then keep moving. It's important to keep moving so your body doesn't fall asleep collapsing from the exertion at altitude. At the summit, Puna tells me it's a good idea to leave 10 rupees to the Buddhist deities, and I follow his lead. The two metre high rock cairn represents the Buddhist stupa or chortan, with Tibetan flags running away 30 metres in several directions. I sit and feel the earth's quietness, its stillness and peace here on the, on the past summit. The Tibetan flags wave their prayers out into the world. It is so beautiful, the rich brown valleys, the snow-capped peaks, the remoteness and a landscape that seems to go on forever, forever. It's like there is nothing more important in the world than this feeling, this isolation, this wilderness. And there's something the indigenous tribes the world over knew well and lived with every day. So what happened to us? We became industrialized and mechanized and digitized, bigger, faster and more intelligent to the point where we are perhaps now a species out of control, lost and distant, and from the natural boundaries the earth provides. So just going on to the uh, fourth one. So this is day 20. So we're well and truly up, um, you know, up in the, the higher reaches. Um, it, it's a village called Ringbo, which is about three and a half thousand meters. And I'm slightly ahead of the of the photo. This is actually our first pass, which was about 3,600 meters. And behind is the, the very large massives of, um, ooh, I've just forgotten their names, but anyway, <laughs> that's all right. Um, so I walk back into the village. Like we're at Ringmo at the moment, uh, near Puxandu Lake. I walk back into the village and see an elderly lady collecting uh, goat dung in the apron of the dress. I walk past a little ashamed to be wearing $120 uh, sandals, $80 trousers, $150 thermals, $40 merino gloves, $40 thermal beanie, $400 down jacket and $280 outer jacket. I'm humbled by my privilege and I have such admiration for what these people have, a strong, tightly knit community, a, a dependency on e each other to survive, a connection far closer to the earth than any of us in the West know unless we are driven to find them. I realize this is what drives me or has done since I was 19 when I rode my motorcycle to the tip of Cape York to spend many nights under the heavens, connecting to the natural cycles of the earth, marveling at the full moon over the waters of the Kennedy River and hunting with the indigenous people from Lockhart River Mission who accepted me into their tribe. Now, some 39 years on, my adult children flown from the roost and I seek this solace again, this need to understand indigenous culture and to hear the solid art heartbeat of planet Earth. I recognize this as an underlying journey in this world. It's what I seek to be a part of, most of all to share with those who may not wish to take, make this journey, yet 
want to understand the calling of planet Earth, to understand the deeper knowledge of connection and wisdom that Indigenous people world over have known for tens of thousands of years. I believe this time, the time has come, particularly in the West, to incorporate this knowledge into our lives. Um, et, uh, et mulier sapientus again. I think it means, it means wise men and women, and I explain it more fully in the book. That's, uh, um, have always known, but for the past 200 or more years, we have stepped away from Mother Earth through, through industrialization, mechanization, and now digitization. It's time for a quiet, peace loving reformation to um, claim back what is our birthright as human beings. And may the Buddhist deities cheer from the balconies of Budna, uh, Mecca, St. Paul, St. Peter's Basilica, the Blue Moss, the Amar Moss, there's a whole list of them here. What I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that it's a, it's a spiritual connection which these magnificent structures, the human structures um, uh, across the world. And I've actually also got here um, the central deserts of Australia. I, I wrote an article some years back um, about the Lara Pinta and, and being connecting and seeing the indigenous Australian people on that trip. So that's another story. Okay, so. Oh, this is a funny one. Um, so this is in Japan. This is the last, uh, we spent two days in Japan, just sort of the final bit of the trip. And Japan is a, um, a small town and it's, and it's sort of hung on the side of the very steep country that uh, uh, on the foothills of the Himalayas. And it's also where, the, where these plains will land. It's about a 30 degree, 20 to 30 degree uh, airstrip. And uh, these little twin otter planes uh, come every, I don't know, every few days or a week every week, um, and they land on this on this uh, on this airstrip, which has got bitumen on it. I was most amazed to see that. That's only been in the last few years, and uh, yeah. So anyway, this is the the last days in the guest house. The guest house is large, but there are a few guests: a French couple with their five year old daughter camp in the spacious garden, and a Hindu ceremony with ten participants is taking place in the garden when we arrive. It is still going on after nightfall, a quiet and persistent process. I take great pleasure in washing some of my gear, including my boots in the preparation for the plane journey to Kathmandu. Philip fun, uh, finds me a barber, so off I go to have this wildness cut and shaved from me. I cannot stay like this forever, the wild man from Robert Bly's Iron John. The barber shop is located uh, among narrow streets that seem to hold Every type of small business imaginable, the steepness of this small town requires the shop to be contoured. The barber shop is no exception. It has two levels, yet it is only several metres long. The barber looks at me with some astonishment. Perhaps he has never cut and shaved a Western man before. Perhaps he can't see the need, or perhaps he's just impressed by my bushy grey dusty beard. He, he, allows, he asks me, what I would like through a young interpreter, and I try to explain, short, neat, and clean shaven, please. But this seems to get little understanding, so I point to a photo pinned to the wall of a young man looking very chick. He sets to work with an electric razor. A small gathering of younger men appears. They are fascinated by this Westerner in the hands of their local barber. They are genuinely interested, and they watch in fascinate, fascination. And I had to try to keep a brave face, not wanting to dis disappoint the small crowd that has gathered. Eventually, the barber and I relax into a flow of this 60-minute process. The shave is the most interesting experience for me. He uses a cutthroat razor after he has removed the bulk of my beard with the electric razor. And then he takes his time using several hot flannels to soften and open the pores of my skin in preparation for the razor. I am by this stage humming somewhere in the mountains of over Tibet and thinking of home and my children, family and friends after what can only be described as one of the most extraordinary journeys I've ever done, the Himalayan landscape, the rich Tibetan, Tibetan culture and the two men who made it possible for me, Philip and Kuna. I floated from the barber's chair to the Tibetan plateau of my mind and also had some understanding of why women love to go to the hairdresser which in fact is what one of my daughters has followed as her profession. Two hours of standard dad and so is $300. And I now can understand this as I float back to the guest house and Dilip and Puna are sipping tea, chatting to the Nepalese guests, and of course, enjoying a cigarette or two. 
they too are celebrating in their own quiet way. They have nearly got this Western man home safely, no mean feat, considering the number of times I fantasized about running off into the mountains, to set up a permanent camp and visit the Tibetan border and, uh, and bribe the Chinese guides for an entry permit. But I was a good boy and we are bathing in the glow of accomplishment and a team effort. I watch um, a local man declaring his love to a woman in the garden below. They were both past their prime and I watch as the guest house owner walks over and biffs the man. I thought this was rather an odd way to treat someone, a full view of his guest. Although I was the only guest witnessing it, it seemed that he biffed him again and again. And I wonder if I should intervene. Dillip and Puna have gone to their room for a nap. And I, what, what was I to do? Fortunately, the guest house owner walks away. He had made his point. It seems he didn't think the man virtuous enough as the couple were at least in their late 40s. Maybe this was requited love, but I thought the guest house owner was being rather brutal and I found myself rather suspicious of him. His behaviour was not at all Buddhist and thankfully we were only here for the one night. The guest house itself, however, was lovely, positioned high on a ridge overlooking the valley we had come from and the Himalayas unfolding beyond, all visible from the dining room. So that's, um, that's all the readings. I just wanted just one last thing at the end. It's a, a postscript just to explain that this trip in some ways is only, well, it's more than half complete, but um, yeah, the, the very upper reaches of Dolpo, uh, which are um, quite tightly guarded by authorities and you have to pay, I think it's about 500 US dollars to, to visit. But that is the work of um, uh, George Shaler and, of course, Peter Matheson. Uh, George Shaler was the zoologist. Um, they put recommendations in the, after that trip that that whole area should become a national park. And that is what has happened. So um, that's a good thing. But I would love to go back and finish that off. It would take about um, uh, probably another 20, 24 days or so. Yeah, that would, that would be good. Uh, it's October 2020, and my original plans to uh, return to Kathmandu in the northwest region of the Himalaya have been thwarted by COVID-19. Realist realistically, the opportunity to return will be when the vaccine has been developed, most likely in September, October of 2021. That might be a little ambitious in thinking that. Uh, in many ways, this uh, story is now is not complete without Shea Monastery, Crystal Mountain, and Saldane in the upper Polto, uh, Dolpo region, a very cold and remote place on the edge of the Tibetan plateau. To visit there, we'll complete this journey in the footsteps of the snow leopard as there, those areas hold great interest to me in terms of the Tibetan culture and the remoteness and of course where Pete Madison and George Shaler did most of their field work in regards to the beloved snow leopard, which by, which interestingly enough is on the rise in numbers. It was heavily hunted by Europeans particularly um, in the 1800s, and there is good news about their position these days in terms of surviving. In regards to this story of my 24 days and the profound experiences I have uh, I had there in terms of feeling the ancient rhythms of planet Earth and our need as a species to nurture this Earth, I believe we have no choice but to dramatically alter our current course. I hope this is what you have gleaned from the story and I hope it spurs you on to be part of the crusade in whatever way that you can. And may future generations of people thank us for having the foresight and strength to move beyond the current limitation structures that makes up our lives, but which uh, don't necessarily honor the planet that keeps us alive. I believe anything is possible in our future and we do have the intelligence to change course to that which let's just see it. Thank you. That's all. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying those photos. I, I um, uh, what do we do now, Bianca? Very much. <laughs> yeah, up to you. You can keep them scrolling or something like that while okay. we um, we keep chatting. Um, all right. We haven't. I haven't received. Um, I have received one question. Um, yeah. Uh, one attendee wanted to know on the uh, the um, one of the images of the cannabis plant um, yeah. and was saying sort of is marijuana legal over there? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> um, oh look, it's it's been a trading commodity for uh, I don't know 150 years probably. It was introduced from India, um, and it's I mean they it, 
they just have it there because they use it for oil development. They, yeah, yeah I, I certainly was not offered any for sale, or I mean, I could, could I suppose, but uh, the, the, it grows around the villages and mainly in the lower regions, up to about two and a half thousand meters. So um, yeah, but it does grow very well, as you can see. Um, but yeah, there, there's certainly no um, limitations as to what. I mean, you don't. I didn't see any big, you know, thousand acres of, <laughs> of marijuana. It was actually something that would grow sort of along the roadway or on the trail. Yeah, yeah. Point, I think or it's around such some a different farm. perspective. Yeah, yeah, it's just an, and and it's predominantly for its oil. That that was you know for cooking. Yeah, very um and and probably for some medicinal. Yeah. Well, that question has prompted another question, and we're the, okay. they're uh, popping up now. All of a sudden, everyone's yeah. had their immersive visual reading experience. It's like, okay, okay. question time. Yeah. So, one attendee would like to know: Did you actually spot the these elusive snow leopards? Uh, no, no, no. We did. I never saw one. Um, they they certainly could have been around in the very high passes where where we were, and and I saw foxes, big bushy tailed foxes. Yeah. That, um, which I would think were introduced because of, um, you know, uh, British and European settlements in, in the 1800s. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's the case there. Um, but they certainly were pretty fine specimens. But they, they are te they, the snow leopard tends to be in the even higher country. So it's north of um, uh, that upper Dolpo region, which is where predominantly uh, Peter and George Taylor did their work and that's what become a national park. But I did bump into a young uh, biologist. He was working for one of the universities in Kathmandu. Um, and, and he was specifically in this town called Dotarat, which is an incredibly interesting town. Um, yeah, it's one of these crossover of uh, trading centres from Tibet and, and, uh, and everywhere else for that matter. Um, and he said he'd set up uh, cameras to take photos of these things because he was convinced they were in the foothills around Dotarat, which is a village that's probably three and a half or maybe a bit more, nearly 4,000. But he'd been there about three weeks and he hadn't got a photo. So, <laughs> But that doesn't mean to say they're, they're not there. They're incredibly elusive animals. So. Yeah, I was going to say three weeks is a pretty small window of time. That's right, yeah. <laughs> In the exactly. grand scheme of things. And, of course, that, that window of time when we can move around is, is sort of September to October. Otherwise, you know, it's pouring rain before that and it's... Um, freezing cold after that so which doesn't bother us so yeah i mean peter like myself uh, named the book and started because it's one of those elusive things yeah they're, they're there definitely there. <laughs> <laughs> he's not coming out to say a lie so. well good i'm glad i didn't have to um i wasn't going to put the pressure on in case it was a, a plot spoiler or anything uh, no no um, but tim yeah. another attendee has asked um what if you had to name one which i'm sure it's very difficult what was the, um one highlight of the oh trip? gosh uh, look uh, there was there were 10 highlights in the book um if I had to name one of them, um, it, it would be those experiences that I read out of, of um, the very high passes and, and there's no other sound, you know, there, there, there is no other human sound apart from Philip and Puna. <laughs> and so those were the, the high, that's the highlight for me. And I, I think that's what drove me when I was a young man of 19 and going to Cape York and spending time with our Indigenous Australian I, I just feel there's so much knowledge uh, with them. Yeah. And, there is and so much to learn. Yeah. yeah, so much to learn. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think we're going to do that. We're, we are heading that direction. I'm very confident. Needs yeah, keep up well. Well, curiously, we've got a lot of questions coming in now. So um, yeah. luckily, we've got plenty of time. Um, yeah. The other question was, did you see day to day sort of um, much in the way of the um, Buddhism practice um, with the with the local people that you got to know? Um, look, everywhere, every single village, every pass, um, you know, there was Tibetan flags. There was um, so the, the, the only people traveling on this route were uh, well, they'd be Tibetans and Nepalese who who live there, and and so the actual practice of would have been done in their own homes. And no, I didn't I didn't get to see that. The, the guest house that we stayed at in Ringmo was Ringmo would have been perhaps the closest in terms of because um, they're not all necessarily Buddhist. Like, like 
we're not all ne not necessarily um, Christian or Muslim or you know we, <laughs> so but but every single whoops, every single village um, you know pass anywhere significant had it just had Buddhism stamped all over it and as I was describing that little um, carved into the furniture of, of that little village um, guest house uh, and it's it's essential essentially what the Nazis adopted but uh, it, I found it most interesting the more I started to to, to research it and find out that it's, you know, it goes back thousands of years, or oh, well over a thousand anyway. And um, yeah, so that you'd see that on the furniture and, you, and you'd see, um, yeah, just symbols of it. But when you say the actual practice, um, it's something I did um, prior to leaving on this trip was I went to Copan Monastery. I was um, a 10 day, um, Koban Monastery is set up for Westerners to learn about Buddhism. So that was my main fix, if you like, um, in terms of what Buddhism is about. And most certainly everywhere I travel, there would have been people in practice and in meditation and in, you know, doing. And I went to a couple of monasteries as well on, on route, very isolated monasteries. So there'd only be one, I'm not sure if they're a lama or a, yeah, and, and a, and one, or, one or two helpers. But um, yeah, it's uh, you breathe it. You breathe um, <laughs> Buddhism while you're there, and and particularly that area, it's it's called Bon religion, which is a, a, a sort of I'm not sure if it's older than Buddhism or it's just a, but it's like a branch of Buddhism. Um, and uh, the Dalai Lama, not so many years back, or oh, maybe ten years ago now, he he um, decided that that should be very much a part of Buddhism because he's he's about protecting the the, the core of and uh, there are certain parts to you know what how Buddhism has developed that he doesn't want it included in, in you know, how he sees it. But that's another whole story. But yeah, uh, and the chort every village you go into, uh, well, particularly the bigger villages like Ringmo and um, uh, uh, um, yeah, you, you know the entrance to every one of these and the exit point of these is a chorten or, or a series of chort. Uh, eight in a row. They're, they're just a sort of stone structure that have been whitewashed and very beautiful, you know, from a building point of view, they're very beautiful and um, they're just so, they're just so Buddhist. So, yeah. Well, we're really yeah. pleased we're able to share um, the, the, the photos. You're able to share those photos with good. us. Because yeah, they good. They, they say a lot. Yeah. They do. So they do. And there was yeah. lots of comments coming through just saying how stunning they are and good. also the beautiful um, passage of text you read out. Um, uh -huh. Something that, yeah, stood out to me was where, you know, that image of the Tibetan flags waving their, their prayers yeah. out to well. <laughs> that was really, yeah. I don't know really if people resonated. are familiar with what, the, the, what behind those Tibetan flags, but they their prayers. There's probably a, oh, not a thousand, but several hundred prayers on each one of those, and they tie them up into places, you know, in the mountains and significant areas and around their village and what have you. And they break up and fall apart over a period of you know months or a year. And the idea is that these these float out into the universe. That, you yep. know, precious here. And, and the other thing I keep you would have seen those stones, those money stones. They they're like they're like a, an encyclopedia of Buddhism. You know, that they would carve and they would be, at, uh, I mean, potentially they're 2,000 years old, but they, they were too well kept to be that. They might be 200 years old, maybe at the most. But um, yeah, I, they, they were huge. They were called many walls and they were about a metre high of just these stones about the size of your laptop, for example, or bigger, two laptops. And, um, and the intric intricacy, the intricacy in their carving, you, you probably would have seen it. But, um, yeah. I was just going to say, did you want to keep the slideshow going just while we're answering questions? I'm yeah, just aware sure. that um, yeah. uh, for the recording, anyone who's watching um, will just be seeing a static image at the moment and won't um, yeah. have yeah. those images okay. in the background. Or yep. we could just go well, back to your screen talking as well. Yeah, no, that's um, fine. Another question, and it is actually, it's more of a technical question. Um, what camera did you use when you were taking these photos? <laughs> and, this is um, what people find really interesting. I, I'm not someone who likes to travel particularly in a developing country like the poor with a big fancy camera, that was at S7 Samsung. Yeah. All these photos are from. Yeah. I love being able to take a snap, uh, take a shot when I see something and put it away. I put it, so I have a little pocket of my, my uh, pants and uh, all these things are interesting. There's still corn and all sorts of goodies in there. 
Yeah, that's um, one thing I noticed was the corn. It's just phenomenal. Yeah, well, it's a it's just a, one of those prolific crops. And uh, now that yeah, the, I, I did see seeds um, drying, uh, marijuana seeds drying or cannabis seeds, uh, but not in any quantity. It was uh, yeah. Um, there was a few other questions. I'm just yep. going um, back to them now. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, now, before I forget, I will also, Tim, um, if you could just read out your Instagram. Um, oh, sure, yeah. Well, it's actually, it was my name, Tim Easton, and then we had, a, we had to put a name on there of Going Beyond Expedition. So that's, uh, that's the call for it. But either, either one, my name will be all right so yeah. going beyond and, uh, expeditions yeah that's right the idea was to actually get across into eventually into, um, uh, there are apparently the um attendees uh, someone said that they've tried searching and there's a few a couple of different tim eastons that pop up so if there's anything that's okay. specific for your that, chat um yeah we'll, we'll go i was go able to on, find it yeah it, it, just for one word all one word uh, going beyond expeditions yeah and um, <laughs> that was with the idea of going into the to, uh, to work on that. Um, right. I'll pop that yeah, to so that's that. And then, yeah, the Tim, the the www one. You you do have to be mindful that it has a U on the end because apparently there's a guitarist in um, in America of the same name. So you've got yeah. to have www.timmeesterdoneword.com.au. Right. Quite right. one that Jennifer has uh, designed. So. Yeah. Good fun. Yeah, yeah. I um, it, um mm. it's a really, really nice website. Um, mm. so that was that. And um, so yeah, just in terms of what you visited, um, uh, someone wants to know whether there are any specific temples, monasteries, or places of Buddhist meditation. Um, yeah, I mean, couples. it's not a it's not a tourist area, and th there are small um monasteries but they wouldn't be receptive to i mean we could i could visit for, you know for an hour or two and the lama would show me around but they're not they're not in any way set up to take um people you know um compared to you know back in Kathmandu, for example where you know copan monastery for example is just a beautiful place this is the lady i was talking about oh, oh and there's the, the little carving book that's bond religion oh yeah yeah oh, sorry funny. i just interrupted um yeah so i mean th this is a very remote part so you can go and certainly see lots of um you know influence and it's people's daily life and you see you see people in prayer and meditation and uh, all of those things but um it's not there to sort of just think we can learn from that that's just their daily life yeah so um they're much better setups for that and I keep going back to Copan as one but there are certainly others but that doesn't mean to say that uh, you know myself as a traveler going there uh, they don't they, they're very happy to receive who I am and um, yeah but um, yeah they aren't people necessarily they, they live there they've lived there all their life and um, they're part of it you know part of the landscape so that's ice by the way that was another very high camp there's a whole story around that in the book yeah, that was pretty extraordinary. We had two visitors during the night. Oh, and this is the caterpillar mushroom tray. That was, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Got to be quick. <laughs> yeah, I, that, that is the whole story around that thing. That was in the middle of the wilderness and had to have been put in by horses. And that's part of the money that would have come, come from the caterpillar tray. To be able to buy that thing, which most likely came from Kathmandu or somewhere with a significant uh, deal working. Yeah. Anyway. So I just had a few other questions as well. Sure. Um, just mindful, we've got about 10 minutes left. So anyone keep the questions coming. This is brilliant. It's it's just we've got a really nice um, you know, discussion flowing. Um yeah. so this question. Um now just noting as well earlier, there was a an attendee who asked, um, so just to confirm there's no um pictures in the book, is there, Tim? It's um No, no, uh, it's it was part of the cost. Um the, the first book I did had 130 photos in it and it's a beautiful book, beautifully laid out, but it, you know, it's it's selling for forty-eight dollars. And this one now through Avid Reader is twenty-five. So that's the that's the difference. Yeah. So that's why the the Instagram and website are, are there for that. Look at those heads of marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, did you? How did you take notes um, as you travelled? Um, oh, my little S eight. 
I had a, I, you know, the phone has a little note section, that, and that's all I did, yeah. So, yeah. But the photos were a wonderful way of remembering when I, and now this is inside one of the Chortons. So you talk of Buddhism and, and, and the influence within a, that, that's probably several points of any village or any decent sized village. Yeah, there's another one, that's a Chorton. And inside of that would be Buddhist paintings and, uh, oh, just beautiful, beautiful paintings and done by people who really know what they're doing. It wouldn't have been the villagers necessarily. It was, um, yeah. yeah, you really get a sense of just the, the magnitude, the depth of the landscape. Yes, yeah, yeah, and there's yeah, there's a lot of other things. It was an interesting question I ever said was there one particular thing and <laughs> just seeing these photos reminding me that's a that's a that's a ladder that we saw going up there just and they carved these things and yeah, there's another one they carved these things out of a tree trunk from quite good forests as well. So beautiful you've seen the photos of, uh, of forests in the in the pretty well in the lower, you know, around the two thousand meter, fifteen hundred, two thousand meters. Yes, but this is once again the entrance of, I think it was terracotta, and that's a money stone, and the intricacy in that. I mean, and it's got to be several hundred years old, easily. And uh, these are, you know, the, the prayers, the Buddhist prayers, and, um, you know, they just repeat and repeat and repeat. I, I just, I found that really moving, really moving to see this. And that's what you call a, a money wall, because it's, and I'd, you'd see these everywhere, you know, just everywhere. <laughs> Even in quite remote places. Yeah, fascinating. And really, I mean, to carve something like that, you know, you don't do that overnight. That would take oh, months, you know. Uh, full time. And these women, they're preparing for, for winter, so they are hard at work. They don't stop. Yeah. And then, you know, you see them with firewood and you see them with, with um, that would have been spotter. And drying meat. This is all preparation. Uh, that would have been goat meat. Oh, this is a bit of a story, this one. You'll read about this. This is a, a guy who, uh, very suspicious character, actually. I think he was trying to, he wanted me to buy this particular shell. That's a, that's, um, and a very important shell uh, to do for Buddhism, uh, conch, which, um, of course, is in other um, religions as well. But, uh, yeah, so that, that's another story, very well, interesting. And then uh, a man in Dotarap is, uh, is actually jailed uh, in, the, in the, one of the, stories that I tell because he's taken Buddhist um, uh, you know ornaments to to sell yeah so and that's a very sad Sorry, story. Tim I'm just going to jump in we've just got a few more questions coming on if that's sure. okay for me to yeah. um, sort of um, field those to you as we go sure. um, so what influence did um, did uh, Peter Matheson uh, his book have on your journey <laughs> um, that's a good one, yeah. Look, Peter Matheson, um, he's an extraordinary writer, an extraordinary writer, and one of his main reasons for doing that trip was his, uh, he'd lost his wife to cancer, Deborah, to, um, uh, to cancer, and that would have been about uh, a year and a half or so before he did, decided to do this trip, and he felt he had to do this trip to, to, to um, I think the word is samsara, that's the Buddhist term to to do with suffering. I've got this explained in the book. And um, it's to do with suffering. And, and we all suffer um, on various things. And, and I felt I had a story to tell a bit about suffering. And that's my samsaras in the, in the story. So, uh, to, so what influence? I mean, Peter's writing, oh, my goodness me, and, and his knowledge of Buddhism. I mean, he had five, he had three lamas and two uh, doctors or PhDs. Um, colleagues from America help him write that so um, yeah and it took him five years to write that story so it, it is the most remarkable um, yeah story to read so it, it, it inspired me the the wildness of where he went was certainly a big part of that and um, and, and this idea of, of samsara because I've, I've had my share of that and I felt I wanted to share it so um, yeah <laughs> and uh, Peter's book is called The Snow Leopard. Is it's called right? The Snow Leopard. That's right. Yeah. Interestingly enough, I was just checking today on Booktopia. They sell Peter's The Snow Leopard for thirteen dollars fifty, and they've got my book listed for thirty eight dollars fifty. It's just ridiculous. So make sure you shop it, have it read it. Right? <laughs> yeah. Hey. <laughs> have it read it. Have Thanks for the streak. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Support hey. your independent bookshops. <laughs> now along here there are vultures. This section of the of the story, there are vultures here, and I, I and I didn't know why there were some 
approximately 30 of these things are up and down the hillside. And if you've ever seen vultures, but they are really scary birds because they fluff themselves up and they're huge. And they were feasting on a dead, um, it would have been a dead mule. And uh, I, I, we watched them for, I don't know, probably the point wasn't even an hour, but it was just fascinating. You wouldn't have seen them in the photos. They're quite well disguised, but they're but they're big, and um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was further back. You know, mm. Mm. that's one of the traditional. Oh, this little girl, her dad was very helpful to us um, one one time, and yeah, I just sort of connected with her at the breakfast. So, and then I had my cat, my camera. I gave it to to one of the tea house guys, and he's there. For I didn't know that. Oh, there the oh no, that's Varel. That's good. That's what um just on the left hand side there. Those the sheep is what the uh, or goat really. That's what the um snow leopard will eat. Yeah, they're very, very good hunters. And look at these. I just love them. I just love them. It's it's difficult to know, you know, are they 200 years old, 300 years old? It depends how long they've been out in this weather, uh, somewhere under undercover but anyway they're, they're certainly ancient in their text but then to be carved in this way I, <laughs> and and you'd, you know you'd be walking and you know you'd be further the way up one of the, the sort of passes and, and you'd come across one of these walls so you know people would put them there and carve them and <laughs> to me it's just a strong belief in, in their in their culture their religion so, mm. Um, just a good question in terms of like you were just saying about this, um, this, you know, I guess, stepping into this place feels like you're, you're surrounded by these ancient practices and ancient mm. um, uh, yeah. artifacts and that type of thing. Um, an attendee has asked, um, are there any signs of modernization creeping into the culture there? Um, at, at Dotarap, which is where these photos are taken now, there's, there is a, a school that has been developed and there's actually it's quite a funny story. I, well, I thought it was funny anyway, attached to an internet tower that has been built there. And of course, it doesn't work. It, just, it doesn't function. But there is a school that has been rather beautifully um, built and, uh, um, and, and its whole sort of goal is to, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Protect Buddhist, uh, Buddhist um, uh, religion and, and, you know, their ideals. So... Yeah, so that's about it for modernization. There's a bit of black. Oh, this is the father. I really connected with this guy. Yeah, he was wonderful help to us. I love both of his children. And Tibetan, you can see they're Tibetan. They're very, very dark skin. So. Um, yeah, but, you know, but apart from a bit of black polypipe, and oh, they're the vultures. These are a little bit random. So, yeah, look at these things. God. <laughs> <laughs> they really are what they And there's the poor old dead mule, which, yeah. But um, yeah, they they just I don't know they do something to me those birds. Pretty crazy. Um, but, um, we're going to have to wrap up very shortly. We have reached our time. As much as I would love to just continue rolling with the, <laughs> the photos and the discussion, right. it's been really really enjoyable, um, really inspiring. Thank you, um, Tim, so much for sharing your journey and these readings. Um, it was very generous of you and. Mm. Uh, I would just like to say um, from Avid Reader, thank you so much um, for your time this evening and to our attendees, thank you. Um, now, Tim or Angela, did you have sort of a few final words you just wanted to, to say before I, um, I break open the room to our raucous applause? <laughs> raucous applause. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, well, I'll just say thanks for the opportunity to um, represent Pencil Tree. And Stevie would have loved to have been here and gives his um, apologies for not being able to make it tonight. So I, it was remiss of me not to say that at the beginning. Um, but he might get to watch this recording. So I better make it good now that, you know, to, to mention him again. And um, being his birthday soon. So I think he's um, really looking forward to seeing you tomorrow, Tim. That's personal. Yes. Yes, and I'll meet right. you tomorrow in the flesh too. That's right. Thank you, Angela, for filling in at the last minute. So, oh, it's my absolute yeah, pleasure. Yeah, Steve, Steve's just, yeah, he's having a bit of a rough time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And thank you all for coming. I could just, uh, <laughs> I'm good to see one daughter out of three children has uh, turned up. <laughs> David and Jamie.
Yeah. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. You You've been a very yeah. supportive, engaging audience. Um, I should yeah. say engaged yeah. with your questions. Um, so, um, and also I did know um, a couple of people, I'm not sure if it might've been the time difference or whatnot with the link joined a little bit later. This is recorded. So it will be popped up on and made available on Avid Reader's YouTube channel. Be sure to check us out. We do have a lot of um, our events um, available to rewatch. Um, follow us on Twitter to find out about what um, events and books we're promoting at Avid Reader for 101. Um, and that's all from me. I'll let you um, go ahead and enjoy your Friday evening and I'm going to um, allow you all to unmute. So mm -hmm. everyone should be able to unmute yourselves. Um, and yeah, there we go. Um, so we're just going to uh, finish off with a big round of applause. Please feel free to <laughs> crowd the room. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> you will find the story most interesting, I'm sure. <laughs> well, follow me on, on, on Instagram and your uh, expeditions from there. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you very much and congratulations yeah. again, Tim. Thank you. Can I have a glass of wine now? That'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Thanks, guys. <laughs>